Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the field of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Flavia Anchur and Karina Opliger. Crop variety mixes have multiple benefits, including increased stability in crop production and reduced pest and disease pressure. Unfortunately, testing which mixtures work best for these benefits can be a time-consuming and labor-intensive process. Thankfully, there may be a better way. In this episode, Flavian and Corina join me to discuss their work developing high-throughput field phenotyping methods to shorten that intensive learning curve. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Karina Opliger and Flavian Chur with us. Flavian studied agricultural sciences at the ETH Zurich, majoring in plant sciences. After graduation, he had the opportunity to work with future climate scenario data at the Swiss Federal Office of Meteorology. Karina also studied agricultural sciences. She worked at the Agroscope, the Swiss Research Institute for Agriculture, in various projects related to legumes and intercropping. Both are now PhD students in the crop science group at Achim Walter at ETH Zurich. Hello, Karina and Flavian. How are you doing today? Hi, Abby. Hi, Abby. We are doing great. We are very pleased to be on the show today. Good. We are so happy to have you on. So we are talking about phenotyping on some crop mixes today. So to get us started, can you just tell us an overview of kind of the general issue your research is addressing, why it's important, and just give like a quick reminder on what high throughput phenotyping means for people who are new to that topic. Yes, of course. Um, we wanted to work with the diversification approach in agriculture. So today the agriculture is mostly, or what is often used in agriculture is mostly one cultivar or one variety of crop that is uh, sown in a field. And to enhance the diversity in agriculture, there are some options how you can do that. For example, there is crop rotation, which is mandatory here in Switzerland, where we are. And there are also more options, for example, intercropping or intracropping. So intercropping means basically that there are two or more species grown together, for example, peas and barley. And intracropping is when two or more varieties or cultivars are mixed together. And we worked here with uh, intracropping, which is kind of an ecological concept, the variety mixtures. But to come back to intercropping and intracropping, why intercropping is not often used, even though it enhances diversity, it's because there seem to be um, problems with the mechanization of the agriculture. If you have two crops that are not ripening together, you cannot harvest them at the same time, for example. You could um, have problems with the crop rotation if you have like cereal after cereal or legumes. And intracropping is um, interesting because it is possible to harvest some uh, mixtures together if you grow them together, if they are from the same crop. And they even though have the positive effects of the enhanced diversity. So you, they are known to have um, to need less pesticides, for example, because they are less susceptible to pests. We used the concept of overyielding to evaluate the performance of the mixtures because it is known that variety mixtures tend to have um, a higher yield than that that would have been expected from the pure stands. And Flavin will talk later about it, how we calculated the overyielding, just to be short here. And we worked in our uh, study with oats, because oats is a very interesting crop, since it is not too susceptible to pests, but farmers know how to work with it, since it is a cereal. And there is an increasing demand, at least here in Europe or Switzerland, because of, for example, oat milk that is coming. So is overyielding, I mean, most people, when we talk about research, they're often trying to increase yield. So is overyield something that you really want to see in these mixes? And that's like, if we can get them to overyield a bunch, that's great. Or is it just kind of a measure of they all survived? Or is it a way to kind of overcome some of those maybe negative aspects of intracropping where it adds a little difficulty, but you get a lot more yield, so it's worth it. Can you talk to me a little bit more about uh, why you're interested in the overyielding? Uh, sure. I mean, overyield is here just a measure to evaluate how the mixtures are, are doing in that sense. So we 
you calculate over yield in the way that you have, for example, two varieties, variety A, variety B. Variety A has one kilogram of yield, variety B has two kilogram of yield. So you can calculate what you would expect if you mix them together, which would be A plus B divided by two, which is 1.5 kilograms. Or I don't know what you're using sure. in America. <laughs> um, and then you can actually mix them together and grow them together. And maybe if you mix variety A and B together, you will get 1.8 kilograms. So the overyield would be these 300 grams you have more. And this can also be negative, which is then called underyielding. And so it's more or less just a measure to see how well mixtures are actually performing if they are mixed together. Oh, okay. And this, however, is uh, is more or less just a statistical way of uh, telling how the performance is. And usually, what what you see in literature in in such cereal mixtures is that you have between two and three percent overyielding if you mix varieties, um, which is in line with what we found and we'll discuss okay. later. Okay. Okay. So it's kind of like a strength in numbers proving that these crops do better or varieties do better when they're planted together. Okay. I see vigorous nodding. So I, I must have nailed exactly. that one yeah. on the head. That's good. I am just so fascinated by this research. I'm really, really excited. So I had other questions. They disappeared. If they come back later, I'll ask them then. But to keep things moving. So you were focusing specifically on wheat and you had multiple types of varieties that you were putting together in different combinations. So I was hoping to just get an overview on like how you picked what mixes went together as well as like how do you tell them apart if they're all oat crops? You know, how visually diverse are they? You know, is it something where you have to be really, really very familiar with with oat to figure it out or is it you know super variable tell me more about these mixes uh, well we work with uh, oats which is very close uh, related to wheat we also work with wheat a lot in our group but here we work uh, with oats and we choose the varieties that are recommended in switzerland for farmers because we wanted to be close to the practice practical use of this in the end and actually, we cannot tell the varieties apart when they are in the field mixed up together. We had like two-way to five-way mixtures. And there is one, like a, the name is Zorro, which is black, actually. The, they have black grains, which we could remember if we wanted to. But we didn't want to separate them after sowing. We just wanted to look like at traits, for example, the yield. Is it over yielding? Is it more yield than from the pure stands? Or at the other traits like the canopy cover? And we wanted to see how the varieties complement each other. So are they all pretty close on flowering and harvest time and things like that? I'm I'm not sure if oat flowers, but you know what I mean? Like, are they maturing at similar rates here? Or is there a lot of variability there? Because I know you mentioned that can be a problem with intercropping. So uh, There is a certain uh, diversity, but... We are always, if we do experiments, restricted in space. So we we could, could just use five uh, different varieties so that we could use from one up to five-way uh, mixture. So there is a certain diversity, but it's limited compared to other studies. For example, in wheat, we have over 300 varieties on our field. So there we have a much bigger diversity. So... I wanted to kind of loop back on the phenotyping thing since we're talking about the visual aspects of these crops or just diversity. So phenotyping in general is looking at traits that you can observe with your senses. So that could be like those black grains on the Zorro variety or you know plant height, things like that, as opposed to the genetic varieties uh, or variations found in genotyping. So I'm just curious to know more about how you went about testing this. What were your methods? Our methods? So um, we are in a, in a group which is uh, specialized of this high throughput phenotyping or high throughput field phenotyping. So we do all our research outside and we have... Uh, many different ways to measure, as you said, in a high throughput and quickly, even though high throughput is uh, very subjective, I guess. Uh, but in our case, we argue that it is high throughput. So we use uh, different things. We use drones, robots, and we have our own built field phenotyping platform, which is a 
used as a sport system. And I think Corina can tell you more about that. Exactly. We work with our uh, stationary field phenotyping platform. We call it short the FIP. Um, and the FIP is like a rope suspended camera system. So you may know it from uh, soccer games. There are, in our case, four poles uh, at the edges of the, in the corners of the fields. And there are ropes that hold the camera in the middle. And with that, we can um, position the camera over uh, individual plots or plants. And with that, we can take images of a crop uh, over the whole seasons. And this allows us to take dynamic uh, measurements to take image of the same plot over the whole growing season and see how they change. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Flavian and Karina's paper, Mixing Things Up, Identifying Early Diversity Benefits and Facilitating the Development of Crop Variety Mixtures with High-Throughput Field Phenotyping, published in the Plant Phenome Journal, is always freely available. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Let's get back to the show. I am such a fan of all of the creative ways that researchers find to use things that are not specifically like, this is a tool for science. And they're like, it is now. So <laughs> I love that with the uh, the field camera for the soccer fields or possibly American football here. <laughs> People might, might know that a little <laughs> better. Yeah. How did you, you were taking these pictures of your plots to test your different variety mixes and how they were doing. So can you tell me more about how you would actually assess if if these mixes were doing well? Yeah, exactly. So we, we take pictures every, I don't know, two, three days, depending on the weather, because it's on the field we need to, and we don't want to break our cameras in the rain, we need to consider the weather. Um, and then after we have uh, a lot of pictures or images, which is really nice, it often means that you actually have more work to do now and you need to evaluate them somehow. So it's, uh, like in every other research project, you first make a research question, then you make a big mess with uh, gathering a lot of data, and then you try to tidy up. And in this case, we try to tidy up in a way in that we use the segmentation, like a deep learning model, where we considered if a pixel on, a, on an image is either plant pixel or a soil or background pixel. Uh, so we can tell what fraction of an image is belonging to a, to a plant or not. And then we have another problem if with such images is that we don't know where actually the plot is in, in the image because the system moves a little. So we used another approach we developed in an earlier project to define where our region of interest or our experimental plot is in the field. And if we know this special um, the location and the canopy cover over the whole image, we can calculate the canopy cover, the specific plot at a specific time point. And we can do that over the whole growing season for all the mixtures we, we on pure stands we, we planted. Exactly. After, after doing that, we, as we are working in the field, we have problems with uh, spatial heterogeneity. So we correct them according to a framework developed in uh, Wacheningen to uh, reduce the spatial heterogeneity. And after that, we can calculate, as we mentioned before, with the yield in the end of the season, we can calculate the overyield for canopy cover at every time point. And having this information over time and the uh, overyield of the yield in the end of the season, we can do a simple correlation between the canopy cover over yield and the yield over yield and see if there is a correlation over time. And in this case, it was, and we found a significant correlation and interaction between the over yield at an early stage and the over yield at the end of the season. Sure. I have a few questions off of that. My first one is, can you just define what you mean by spatial heterogeneity? Like, what is that concept as relates to this specific project? What does that mean? Well, it's a concept which is not relating to our specific uh, project. It's a concept that sadly relates to all the field experience we have. So the soil is not perfectly well um, the same over the whole field. You maybe have 
for example, mice at one point in time or not. And with this framework, you use a general linear mixed effect model and uh, two dimensional splines to use the genotypic information because we have multiple replications in our field. And uh, with these replications of the different plots and this framework behind, we can smooth out um, trends which are deriving from the soil or from the environment, but not from our genotypes. So we get uh, educated guess or an, a better educated mean um, of the of the real value of a mixture or of a pure stand in our field. Yeah. Okay. So it's basically what you're trying to do here is if you would expect something based on the genetics of something and it's underperforming, it's helping you decide, is it underperforming because it's in a mix and the mix didn't do as well as we thought versus it's it got attacked by <laughs> like a rabbit <laughs> that just ate it and now we're struggling because it's just got eaten. That's kind of what it's for? More or less. So if we actually see that the rabbit is in the field, we would... Uh we would do a different approach because then we have we know what the issue is but it's more for um trends we cannot really see by eye but we know that they are somehow in the field okay so that for example at one point in the field the soil is a bit more dense than in other and this will have an effect on how the plants are growing but we have no chance to correct that because we don't know that for sure but with this statistical method we can correct that in a certain way. Okay, so that makes sense to me. So you mentioned you were kind of measuring data at different times throughout the growing season. So can you talk to me a little bit more about why you picked the specific times that you were kind of measuring? Um, I know you mentioned it's it's kind of throughout, but it seems like maybe there was a, a focus on certain times of the growing period. So can you talk to me about why you picked those and also why that's helpful from a high throughput phenotyping sense? Because in theory, you could just like harvest it and weigh it, but it seems like you're taking a different approach. So can you tell me more about why those decisions are being made? Sure. So we wanted or we are we were looking for a trait which is describing the, the growth of plants in an early phase because we wanted to see if we can see positive uh, effects of combining or of mixing varieties already early in the season. And canopy cover is one of these traits which is uh, telling us very well how plant stands or plots are, are behaving in the early season before the canopy is too dense and we say the canopy is closed. So that is why we focused on the early phase and measurement and we did a lot of measurements in the early early phase and actually just evaluated the early phase because after a certain time canopy cover is not interesting anymore. Exactly. And that that is something that you always want in breeding, right? You want a trait that like predicts on another trait, mostly it's yield and not just have the field with the varieties and then just look at the yield, but you want another trait to explain also how is the yield that we're coming to that. Sorry, yeah, we were interested in in an early trade because uh, an issue with this variety mixture is, as Corina very nicely said in, in the beginning, they sound really great, but the more varieties you have to mix, the more potential combinations you have. And if you, so we also saw that not all of the mixtures are like behaving better or improving the yield or whatever you are looking for. So you would actually need to test all of them. And this is very, very labor intense. So it takes a lot of time. And if, if you are interested in a, in a realistic uh, yield value in the end of the year, you need to wait for the whole season and you need to have a big enough plot so that you can measure yield appropriate. And if you have a trait like canopy cover, you can measure that already very well on a smaller plot. So you save a lot of space. And if you can tell that even earlier in the season, you maybe don't need to wait the whole season, but you can screen for mixtures in between two different crops or so. Yeah, I like that because it really underpins like the value of the high throughput aspect of, of this is you're really saving 
all that's why you're saving all of that time uh, instead of having to just wait and harvest and actually check the yield that you for sure got in the end. So I think that is a great lead into the results. So what did you find? Yes, exactly. Um, we found uh, an overall positive overyielding of the mixtures. It was about uh, 2%, which is also in line with what is in the li- literature, what we can expect from um, variety mixtures. This means exactly that the mixtures have a better yield if they are together and not uh, from their poor stand slowly. But uh, what is even more important is that we have found this uh, correlation between the or yielding the better performance in canopy cover at an early stage and the correlation to the yield in the end, to the over yielding in the end, which uh, as Flavian explained before, is a very nice trait to find good mixtures in an early stage. Sure. You mentioned already that some of the mixes did better than others. So did you find anything as relates to that, such as, you know, if you have five, it's always worse, or this variety does really well in mixes and this one does not play well with others and should be by itself. Did you find anything with your different mixes? Yeah, actually, that, that was, uh, we were surprised by the results. So we found that in, in our case, the two-way mixtures always uh, were better than three-ways or four-way mixtures. We lift the five-way mixtures a little out because we just have had one five-way mixture because we had five, five varieties. Uh, but actually that was a uh, counter our prior hypothesis because we thought r- from an ecological perspective, we would have expected that the higher the diversity, the higher the overall or the yield in the end would be. And actually that we don't really have an explanation for why this is the case. So we are curious to find out in the future maybe. Sure. So we've already talked a little bit about some of the implications about uh, just the value of this research moving forward. But uh, are there other kind of broad reaching implications regarding this research or how it can help breeders or even farmers who are interested in either breeding or growing oats? Yeah, on the first hand, it will or can um make the process of breeding for variety mixtures less labor intensive. You can use it uh, with the high throughput field phenotyping in the first thing. And the other is that if you use a trait like we did the canopy cover, you could use also smaller plots, for example. We worked with uh, six meter plots, but maybe two would be sufficient. So we could screen more varieties and more mixtures uh, in a place that you could do. I think also important is that we, we found over uh, a more or less broad time period that we can see a positive effect. So if you don't have, as we have a field phenotyping platform, you can also use another device to just uh, gather an image and then calculate a real thing from, from this. So you don't need to have this very expensive platform to measure dynamically because we are, we have, we had that and we already tested. So we, we found that you can measure at one point in time, for example, in our case, it was 50 days after sowing and we saw they're the best results. So we can imply for as a method or for further uh, implication that you can in an early season measure maybe one once or twice, or three times and have the same results or similar results or can use at least the same method as we develop. I think that's a, a strength of this uh, idea. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, could a farmer who's interested in just having just like a small little zone, you know, use a drone or get on a ladder with their cell phone, I don't know, and and try and, you know, probably they may not have access to those, you know, specific learning models or whatever to do the in-depth statistical analysis that you guys are doing, but, you know, maybe they can just visually see it because it's phenotyping, which is kind of what phenotyping does. I just really enjoy research that is so open in that sense that other people can just get in, get in and play around and see what happens. So I like that very much. So we've also talked a little bit already about some potential future research opportunities. So where is this research going? Whether that's with oat or different varieties or different crops, what, what, what's next? So 
we have now planted some months ago the, the third experimental year of, uh, of this specific uh, trial. So I think now we can actually start to make some agricultural uh, studies because you kind of want to have more than one or two years, but with three years, you can start to ask agricultural relevant questions and not just in abbreviation, uh, not just a method development. So we are look, really looking forward to to get the data from from this year and see what they what they will tell us. After gathering three years of data, we are maybe even uh, able to provide some recommendations of which uh, variety or variety mixture in this case, of course, uh, is positive to to use and maybe can even be applied for for practice. And then with this data, we can also start to ask other questions, for example. Is there also an effect on the crop phenology? So if we mix varieties together, do they change in the mixture the, the phenologies? Are, are they flowering earlier or later? And as you mentioned, they actually flower. And <laughs> so that could be questions we can ask them with the sensors and data we already have in place. Sure. And then one other small research project which is going on is a bachelor thesis of a student of us. And she's counting in the early, in the emergence phase, um, single plants. So we are curious to figure out if we can even earlier uh, see some positive uh, mixing effects. So that would be really cool if we can take the, the results from this study to an even earlier step. Yeah. But, uh, That's this very is not cool. Done yet. <laughs> yes, and uh, ideally in the future, it may be someday possible to just uh, predict the performance of a mixture just from their pure stance that you would not have to grow the mixture. But this is maybe a future project. Yeah. Or several future, or several future <laughs> projects to come to this. <laughs> That's very cool. Many, many cool projects on the horizon. Can you just define phenology real quick? Uh, yeah, sure. Phenology is, uh, well, actually not so sure how you define it easily. You can define different stages, like uh, for humans, how they are growing. For example, we are a child, then we are a teenager, and then we are an adult. And for crop plants, you can do the same. And so classical phenological stages are, for example, the emergence, so when they appear, from the soil when they start to grow into the heights or begin of stem elongation, when they flower or when they start to ripen so senescence. Uh, so yeah, and depending on how coarse or how fine you want to define that, there are different approaches or, or measures to do to do that. Okay. Okay, so you're looking to study like how being planted together affects how they reach those different stages and what that looks like. Okay, that makes exactly. sense to me. Perfect. Thank you very much. So this has been an awesome conversation. I so appreciate this research, which just has so many cool implications. It's, I love that it has this like sports camera going over these <laughs> crops. That's very delightful to me also. I'm going to just chill out a little bit though and move us forward to our last three questions so the first one is if people want to learn more about any of the things that we've talked about today where can they go uh, you could uh, for example visit our homepage, which we can send to you maybe you can put it in the show notes or our uh, social media channels that we have now new like mastodon or instagram depending on what you're on sure. how old you are <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. We can definitely put uh, links in the show notes for all of those. And then next question is if people want to take that next step and get involved, whether that is as a researcher or farmer or anything else, what can they do? I mean, you could just write us an email. And if you are a farmer that wants some recommendations, <laughs> um, yeah, you could try to cultivate mixtures or send us an email as well. Maybe we can give some up. Yeah, I think the, the concept is so easy that you can, if you are a farmer, you can try it yourself very easily. You don't need a lot, actually. 
So I think that's, yeah, that's the beauty. Yeah. 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 But I think not so many people know about the concept. So I'm, I'm very glad that we have the opportunity to talk here. It's very nice. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you all on, get the word out. And yeah, it's, I love that this research is something that you can just try it. You know, like it, it's, it's rare that we have research on the show where the advice is just, just try it yourself. You know, so so often there's other steps involved to get to that stage. So this is very cool. So last question then is what is one fun fact about you that listeners would not know if all they had was your research? Well, yeah, we ask. So we saw that you asked us this question that we were discussing. I think the, the greatest fun fact that we, about this project is that the, the whole project actually just started because another experiment uh, was not able to take place and so we we saw an opportunity to make this project but first not everyone was fan of the idea and after some meetings we could convince everyone this kind of shows how two phd students could mix up the experimental plans of a research group and hence we also have the title mixing things up as a homage to to this uh, process. <laughs> oh, I love that. That is such a sweet story of, it's like, what a good origin <laughs> story for your research. That's awesome. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. I am thrilled to be able to help spread the word about this awesome technique. I'm excited for you all to be able to now take it on to refining steps for the process and some of those agricultural recommendations. So thank you so much for all the research you both are doing and for your time today. Thank you very much, Abby, for inviting us today. Yeah, thank you very much for having us on the show. It was a great pleasure. Yeah. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Student Spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Fiona. Welcome to the show. Can you start us off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Thank you so much. My name is Fiona Todd, and I'm a rising senior at the University of Minnesota studying sustainable agriculture and agronomy. Awesome. And what are you currently researching? I am currently with Winfield United, where I'm focusing on developing a protocol for inoculating precision amounts of Pythium. Great. And if you could have your dream research project, what would that look like? My dream project would be developing novel forages for livestock operations. Awesome. Well, if you'd like to get in touch with Fiona about her work, we'll have her contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you.